All right, this screencast deals with sleep loss and dream theory. Sleeping in class, level pro. This guy has to have been totally faking it when he <laughs> someone pulled this prank on him or he was truly in stage four. In such a deep stage of sleep that he did not wake up to them shaving his head. Pretty funny. All right. So this section of the book talks about the effects of sleep loss and how sleep deprivation can be very debilitating. Of course, it causes fatigue. When someone is in a sleep-deprived state, it impairs their ability to concentrate. They have a hard time focusing, let's say, in class or work. They are very much... Um, they suffer from difficulty being able to communicate and express themselves. Their ability to think creat creatively suffers when sleep deprivation is plaguing them. The section in the book also talks about how some health-related issues occur. Sleep deprivation has been researched to lead to obesity, hypertension. One of the key things to remember for the test is that it suppresses our immune system. A lot of you can relate to having colds and flus and other sicknesses during a time when they're sleep deprived and their immune system is compromised. Obviously, when we're tired and sleep deprived, we're irritable and our performance slows. We know this is true with greater vulnerability to accidents. People even relate sleep deprivation and the risk you put yourself and others in when you get behind the wheel to that of being intoxicated. We know that sleep's function serves several different roles. Sleep protects. We sleep in the evening when it's dark out, and that's when we're most vulnerable. It's more of an evolutionary explanation. Sleep helps us recuperate. It allows for us to get that slow wave brain recuperation that helps us feel more refreshed and allows for us to think more clearly. There's theories that sleep's role serves for conserving and making memories and memory formation. We know sleep feeds creative thinking. Sometimes our best ideas come after a good night's rest. We also know that sleep plays a role in the growth process. We talked about the pituitary gland at, in the evening releasing somatropin, the growth hormone. There are, there are theories as to um, why we dream, and there are five of them listed in our book, even though there are actually more. They include Freud's wish fulfillment theory, information processing, physiological function, activation synthesis, and cognitive theory. Each of these theories are really necessary to explain the different types of dreams that we have. You can't talk about sleep and dreaming without talking about Freud and his wish fulfillment theory. Freud, remember, believed that dreams were the royal road to our, unco un our unconscious. He encouraged all of his patients during the free association session to talk about dreams if they remembered them. He believed that dreams provided us the psych psychic safety valve for expressing otherwise unacceptable feelings. He believed that every single dream had purpose. When a p person came and talked to him and simply told him what the dream was about, he referred to the remembered storyline as manifest content. And what he would do then is analyze the dream to find a deeper layer of latent content, the symbolism, the hidden meaning he believed was present in every dream. Information processing, I think, really does explain those types of dreams that we have that are very realistic. You know, sometimes you wonder, did I dream that or did I actually experience that? And sometimes we just have dreams that sort out our day's events. We'll see someone during the day and they'll be in our dream at night. Or we'll experience something at school and we might dream about it at night. And it also helps us consolidate our memories. The physiological function theory believes that dreams solely allow for us to preserve our neural pathways. We have these visual images that 
are present on the EEG and the physiological function theory believes that it's just allowing for us to preserve the neural networking that takes place. So this one and activation synthesis really support the idea that there is no meaning in the dreams, that it's just random neural activities that our brain weaves into something meaningful, into some kind of story. So activation synthesis, I think, helps explain those types of dreams where we have random occurrences. We're in one location one minute, we're talking to someone else the next minute, we're maybe swimming, and then we're in a library, and then we're eating a hot dog at the end of a busy street. All of these visual memories our brain interprets and weaves into something like a storyline, but very, very random. Cognitive theory believes that dreams represent our cognitive development and our cognitive ability, our knowledge and our understanding. So it really doesn't address the neuroscience of dreams, but it talks about how a child's dream might be more like a slideshow. And as we get older, our dreams become more detailed and more vivid and more creative, thus matching our cognitive ability. So I really think we do need all of these different dream theories to truly explain all the different types of dreams we have.